society is basically full of a ton of shitheads. And it's the people that can't afford you that laugh at you. They're really noisy. Those people that can't afford you, they're noisy, obnoxious haters. The crab's boiling analogy for anyone listening. When a crab tries to like escape out of the pot, the other crabs try to bring it down. And unfortunately, that is our society to your point, Steve. How do you know what you can achieve if you first don't go for something that's ridiculous? The endorphins, the nuance of your five-year-old self come out and we go, woo, we're going to have fun now because you have fun when you're doing stupid shit. You don't have fun when you're doing impossible stuff. So stoked to be sitting here speaking with Steve Sims. And for those of you that are just hearing Steve Sims' uh, name for the first time, may not be familiar for with his work. He was actually known by as the real life Wizard of Oz. So with that, Steve Sims, welcome to the Soul Seeker Podcast. Let's just jump right into it. Talk about your book, Go for Stupid, your latest book. But before we do, can you just give some context behind being known as uh, the real life world Wizard of Oz? Uh, yeah, well, strange old title, isn't it? Um, for 25 years, I was... Uh, the Mr. Fix it to the richest people in the planet. I worked with people that owned things like countries and I was, uh, I think it was the New York times or the New York post said I was the most connected man in the planet. You'd never heard of. So I was the make a wish foundation for people with lots of money. So if you wanted to get an artist over to you for a barbecue, if you wanted to go down and see the Titanic with James Cameron, if you wanted to go up to the international space station Walk the white carpet with Sir Elton John, play drums with Guns N' Roses. I was the guy you called. I made uh, these fantastical uh, um, events go on and basically gave you better cocktail stories. And that's what I did. But I did it purely and simply, not because I wanted to walk the red carpet and hang out with celebrities, but I wanted to speak with the most rich and powerful people in the planet just to find out how they view time, relationships, opportunities. So I've often said I was not in the business I was in. My job was a Trojan horse in order to be able to get two hours to have a conversation with, you know, the likes like Larry Page, Elton John, Elon Musk, and the, the most powerful people, again, that you haven't come across. I think the Trojan horse strategy is so brilliant. And personally, that's something I'm working on right now as I'm getting into speaking specifically to corporate around the message of soul life balance rather than work life balance. And, you know, it is a Trojan horse type tactic in terms of delivering this message, because I mean, most of us can relate and book a speaker, or understand the importance of mindfulness right now because of the current mental health state given the past few years, but it goes so much deeper than just like checking a box where to hire a speaker, or do breath work. Like a lot of times it's that one little experience that can set someone to go deeper down the path. So I'm glad you brought up the Trojan horse strategy and relaying this back to your book, go for stupid subtitled the art of Re achieving ridiculous goals there it is right there for those of you watching on youtube i love it are you frozen no there we go okay cool <laughs> sweet so how did you even achieve that goal because i mean you were the guy i love how you put it in terms of like make a wish foundation for rich people but doing all these amazing things that even the most powerful quote unquote powerful and rich people on the planet you were the guy making it happen so how did you even achieve that goal you see the funny thing was i wasn't i wasn't scared of it because i wasn't going for it it all starts off with, and, and there's the old classic line that no one steps onto the roof, they climb a ladder. That was what I was doing. You know, it started off by me getting people into nightclubs or closing a nightclub or getting them behind a velvet rope and getting them into a private party, getting them into an unveiling, getting them into a premiere. So it built its way up over 25 years and it just got more magical and fantastical along the way because I always wanted to add an element of it that you hadn't considered. You know, if I could over-deliver every single time, then you could never compete with me. You know, if me and you have a store selling yellow cakes and 
I sell a yellow cake and you sell a yellow cake. We're competitive, you know, mm -hmm. and it's always going to come down to quality of the cake and the price. But primarily under that kind of direct comparison, people uneducated are going to look at the price. But if you've got me and I'm over delivering, you can't price me. You can't, I'm not competitive to anyone because I'm over delivering. And whatever you bring to me, I'm going to give you something more fantastical than that. So it just escalated over the years of me constantly pushing and pushing and pushing. And here's the thing. I never wanted to sit front row at the Paris Fashion Week. Couldn't give a rat's ass about that. But hey, if it's important to you, I'm going to make it happen because I get to have a conversation with you over lunch. That's my, my goal. And if you think about it, no one's ever got fitter from reading a fitness magazine. No one's ever lost weight from buying a diet book. You gain those things as a reaction to the action. So for me, my focus was always over here. I want to have lunch with you. I want to talk to you. Oh, I've got to get you into that club. All right, let me handle that because that's what I want. And so it wasn't a case of, did you get nervous? I wasn't really paying attention to it. It wasn't the, it wasn't the end goal. It was no more than the journey to what I wanted. So that kind of kept me out of being too frightened. That being said, there were many experiences that I pulled off that every now and then I'd wander home late at night going, hang on a minute. I just did that. Bloody hell, that's amazing. So it would always come out. I'd get those moments every now and then. Yeah. And I'm specifically curious in terms of how you made certain things happen. Like say the, uh, seeing the wreck of the Titanic, right? Mm -hmm. I didn't even realize that was like a thing. Is it a thing where people can actually go to it? Or is this something that you had to pull a lot of strings? Cause it seems like the type of events and experiences that you've been leading are the things that you need to pull a lot of strings and not just anyone can do it. Right. Yeah, there are. Um, there actually is a trip being set up now to go down to the Titanic that you just pay and play. Um, it wasn't as defined as that back then. So there was a lot of strings uh, needing to be pulled and a lot of value needed to be presented. See, I've always thought that I never want to treat you like a prostitute. You know, like if I turn around to you and I go, hey, you know, how much is it going to cost me to get you to do this? Mm -hmm. You know, straight away, we're focusing on the money. You're looking at, hey, do I want to sell what I've got for, for a check? You know? Yeah. And the only people that respond to money are people that don't have it. You go up to someone as a billionaire and go, hey, will you do this for that amount of money? They don't care anymore. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the only people that respond to it are those that don't have it. So you've got to basically engage them in a value. Hey, I believe you support this charity. I'd like to do something for it. Hey, I believe you're focused on distributing this. I'd love to help with that distribution. Hey, I'd like to. So focus on something that comes with value. Mm -hmm. There's always going to be a, a price tag in it. It's like buying a car and then being pissed off because you've got to stick fuel in it. You know you're going to have to pay a certain way down the line. But if you can approach someone and just go, hey, in fact, I'll give you an exact story on this. I had um, I had a client that wanted to do a dining experience in Florence. So I actually closed down the Galleria de Academia, which is the museum that houses Michelangelo's David, at nine o'clock at night, set up a table of six at the feet of David. And then for shits and giggles, when they just started on their entree, I brought in Andre Bocelli to serenade them while they ate their meal. And that's what I did. And it was fantastic. And it was amazing. But if I'd approached any one of those people, whether it be the, the uh, academia or Andrea, the string quartet, the chef, any of those people, I'm going, hey, how much will it cost? I'd have got shut down. Mm -hmm. But by approaching each one of those and going, hey, I want to create the most fantastical dining experience ever that can never be topped. I want this person to wake up in a cold sweat in seven years time and go, Holy crap, I cannot believe I did that. Do you want to be part of that dream? And of course, by getting them into the passion, into the moment, and get them to accept that, yeah, you know there's going to be a price tag to get museums and uh, celebrity and talent to do this, but 
it's an afterthought. It's not the thought. And so get them engaged in the moment. Get them in, get them to vision what you vision. Get them caught mm. up in that moment, that dream, and that story, and then go from there. I'm just going to take a moment to write that down. Get them to vision what you envision. That's uh, really well said. Yeah. So in terms of the book, Go for Stupid and uh, Achieving Ridiculous Goals, it sounds like your background is that achieving these ridiculous and almost laughable goals that because they are so large. Why do you think so many people sell them some sell themselves short and are afraid of being laughed at or don't go for bigger goals and really trace chasing their true dreams? So have you ever gone for anything impossible? Not on your level. <laughs> All right. So let, let's, let's put it this way. If I say to you, hey, your current business, let's break down the parameters. Let's get through those ceilings. Let's go for the impossible. We're going to break every, every goal out there that people think is impossible. We're going to achieve it. What happens to your body? You actually get constricted. You actually start getting forceful and you start gritting your teeth. I'm going to go for the impossible. But if I say to you, hey, your business today, let's get a stupid goal and let's go for it. Let's make this ridiculous. Let's see how ridiculous we can go with this podcast and this dream. Do you know what starts happening then? You start smiling because the second it becomes a stupid goal, you start grinning. You can't say the word stupid goal without there being a grin. And when that happens, the endorphins, the neurons of your five-year-old self come out and we go, whoa, we're going to have fun now because you have fun when you're doing stupid shit. You don't have fun when you're doing impossible stuff. Okay. Because mm -hmm. it's a restriction. It's a brick wall. That's why it's called impossible. Leave it alone. Use it as the Voldemort word. Keep it out of your way. But the second your mind starts classing something as stupid, you gamify it. Then it becomes fun. So we used to always go, hey, we got this request from a client. How can we make it stupid? And we had the title of this book held 15 years before there was even a book. We always used to go for stupid goals because you would go for something that was just so ridiculous and you would fail at three times what you would have settled for. So it was always that way of kind of pushing you further. That's why we always had the stupid element within it. But your second part of the question is, why are we so scared? <coughs> Excuse me. Of people laughing at us. Now, here's the thing. Society is basically full of a ton of shitheads. And it's the people that can't afford you that laugh at you. They're really noisy. Those people that can't afford you, they're noisy, obnoxious haters. But let me ask you, do you have a car? Yes. Do you, is it a truck or is it a car? Uh, hybrid SUV. It's an SUV. Okay. Do you want a truck? No. You don't want a truck. Okay. Did you see Elon Musk's unveiling of his truck? Yeah, pretty cool. So let me get this right. You don't want a truck. You were very adamant that you didn't want a truck, but you saw the unveiling of a vehicle you had no interest in because Elon Musk was behind it, correct? No, not because Elon. I'm just personally, I know you're a big motorcyclist, but for me, I look at cars as like getting a point A to point B. So I saw the truck. I did say, oh, that's cool. It is kind of futuristic. I did think to where I think you might be going on this. Um, that people might think I look like a goof in that truck, you know, like I might get laughed at in that truck. But um, yeah, and to answer your question, personally, I'm happy with my car. I have the new RAV4. It's pretty great. It's like a mini forerunner. All right. So you're actually walking into my little sandpit nicely without realizing it. Okay. I don't give a shit if you like the truck or not, but I do care that he got your attention. And he got your attention for something that you pretty adamantly from this conversation don't want to buy, but he had your attention. And today we're in an attention currency. Now, here's the funny thing. He gained the, he gained the attention for people 
all over the planet. And I've asked that question to people in Korea, Australia, China, when I've done podcasts. And they're like, no, no, no. I, I said to one girl that she was in her 30s doing a podcast. She went, I live in Korea. I have a push bike. I'm never going to have a truck. Don't want a truck. And I said, did you watch it? She went, oh, yeah, the whole family did. So everyone was captivated to see what he was doing while most of the people he was grabbing had no care about buying the truck. But when he put the orders up for you to be able to put your deposit on the truck, they sold out of all orders before the end of his unveiling. Now, let's break this down because you're an entrepreneur. This is a man that got the attention of the planet, regardless of whether or not they cared about what he had to offer. That's pretty amazing for a start, correct? Correct. Before he even built a single panel, he pre-sold out every single possible truck that could be built in the timeline. He sold out of everything. Wouldn't you like to sell out of everything before Absolutely. you've even built it? Yeah. So he managed to sell out of everything before even building a conveyor belt. He got the attention of the planet by unveiling something that most people didn't have an interest in. But what were the headlines the following day? I actually don't know. Yeah. yeah I think you remember. Do you remember when the, uh, the bulletproof glass broke when someone threw the stone? Oh, through it? yeah, 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 yeah. So rather than the planet going, oh, my God, this guy grabbed our attention. There was no one in the planet that didn't know about this cyber truck. Like it, hate it, don't give a shit. There was no one that he didn't captivate about it. But would we revere this? Would we congratulate him for grabbing our attention? Or would it be easier for us to just take the piss out of him because his bulletproof glass broke? Mm. And that's what we did as a society. We annihilated him. There were memes. There were jokes about it. Now, I don't know about you, but if bulletproof glass is high on your specifications of a car you need to buy, you've got bigger problems. So he had that. But as a national, as a society, as human beings, we didn't want to congratulate that. We wanted to laugh at that. Today, people don't like to support when they can laugh. They would much rather ridicule you. How many times have you sat around a coffee table with your buddies and gone, yeah, I'm going to do this. I'm going to set this up. I'm going to scale it. Probably franchise that bit. Do that. And as you're talking about your goals and you're getting passionate and you're getting excited, your friends look at you like a deer in headlights and they're like, he's gone crazy. And you notice this. And you're faced with two options. One, walk away from that table or two dilute your dreams. And you end up saying things like, Oh, ignore me. I don't know what I was on about. I was having a crazy minute. Someone must have spiked my coffee. The fact is today there is nobody that we don't revere that didn't have a stupid goal. Larry page, um, Elon Musk, Richard Branson, Walt Disney, Henry Ford, Edison, all went for ridiculous things where they were mocked, protested. That these were crazy, stupid, dangerous ideas. But every single one of them didn't listen, and they carried on. And that's why we have light bulbs, cars, Google, uh, space rockets. That's why we have all of these things, because those people didn't listen to the uneducated idiots out there. And today there is much too much noise that comes from people that can't afford you and shouldn't be talking to you. And I dare you, don't listen to those jerks. Focus on the impact you can create and don't worry about the more ones that were literally just put on this earth to do two things, either A, hate you, or B, work for you. Thank you. <laughs> That's all I can say in response. Uh, I mean, I see why you get paid to speak. That's very <laughs> inspiring and why your book is doing so well, because that is just real and it's authentic and it's relatable and it's something personally that I'm passionate about in terms of the conditioning of society. And I think they're not to get into all of that, but what comes up for me when I hear you speak like that is the crab 
the crab's boiling analogy, which I'm sure you've heard before, but for anyone listening, when a crab tries to like escape out of the pot, the other crabs try to bring it down. And unfortunately that is our society to your point, Steve. Now I do have a question for you, but I'll leave a moment here to see if anything else comes up for you while we're still on this thread. I, th- I think we're going to cover a lot. So um, okay, cool. ask, ask the next thing. Let's see where this one takes us. And I'll try not to jump up on a pedestal too much. <laughs> no, 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 no. Please do. Please do. That's what we're here for. You're, you're the guest. This is your time. And I mean, we're here to <laughs> learn from you and hear your words from the real life wizard of Oz. So this is a great opportunity for all of us. So thank you. <laughs> Having said all that, Now, you and I don't really know each other. We met briefly at Travis Chapel's event a few years ago, Uh, but that's it. I've just been following you. That's pretty much it. But my message is around soul life balance. It's a reframe of work life balance where we put ourselves first and foremost always, right? While simultaneously realizing that work is part of the human experience. I believe that a big reason why we're facing such drastic, such a drastic mental health crisis is because we've severed our connection to our soul or higher self or spirit, spirituality, religion, whatever you want to call it. And I believe the solution is just as simple as this message of soul life balance and everything that comes with it. So when I hear you talk, it, it challenges myself because I find myself staying small where it's like, so I'm bringing myself here so we can apply it and people can apply it to their own. So a real life example, but I think of Simon Sinek and start with why, and I've seen myself being the, the pioneer of this message of soul life balance that I don't care if it's attached to my name, where it's coming from is like my own depression, my own mental health issues of seeing the way that the world runs and realizing if we were to not have this conditioned state of work-life balance of uh, do all these things, uh, glorifying uh, being a weekend warrior, you know, your PTO and then enjoying your life after your retirement, all that type of stuff. And just really asking ourselves the simple questions and getting back to simplicity that it would be a much more harmonious world and a world that I would want to live in. So very similar to Simon Sinek, where the message start with why it's gotten bigger than him. You know, it's not necessarily about Simon Sinek. I see soul life balance going there, but I'm still playing small in the sandbox. So for anyone listening that has something and they kind of feel like how I'm feeling, what would you say to them in terms of actually going out and pursuing that ridiculous, stupid goal or vision? So we all, so you're obviously scared shitless, like most entrepreneurs are. And we're scared of success. We're actually terrified of being successful. We're terrified of getting affluent clients. We're terrified of getting great strategies. We're terrified of getting the attention. Now that may sound really condescending. And to a point it is, but your actions tell me something different. Okay. We are a a human being which is focused on fear. Our primary objective is to survive. We walk past a a bush, it rustles, it's a fight and flight scenario. We see someone that's attractive to us. We're human beings. We want to attract. We're like, oh, that's nice. So we, we, we are primal. Very, very simply, we're primal. And we react to fear. You know, this scares us. Run away. You know, stranger danger, I'm gone. But there's another way to react from fear, okay? You say quite openly that you're playing small, okay? The question really comes down to it, why? You know, why would you do that? Now, you say it starts with why. I incorporate why into everything. Now, we sit there and we go, hey, I'd love to get richer clients, but, you know, I don't know how to talk to them. I'd love to get a new office, ah, but the rent's too much. I don't know how I'm, how I'm going to be able to afford it. Oh, I'd like to get a new marketing strategy, ah, but no one's going to, you know, buy it. So, you know, it's coming up to Christmas. Oh, we're in a recession. Oh, Trump, me, me too. Like, everyone's got an excuse. And that excuse is fearfully stopping them from moving forward. I'll give you a saying that I want you to chant and maybe get tattooed on your inner eyelids. And this simply says, the definition of hell 
is to meet the man or woman that you could have been had you taken that chance. Now, I'm a scaredy cat as well. I live my world on fear. I live up here in the hills in Los Angeles. Nice house, nice life, nice family. I'm good. But I'm not good enough. And if I don't continue to try and grow and experience and fail in the next six months, then I haven't pushed myself. And that's my element. I have to try new things. A lot of people know I go to prison three times a year. I do different events. I do different speaking gigs. I train. I'm a board of directors on various companies. I'm constantly trying to expand what I'm capable and competent of doing. And to be able to find out what you're competent of doing, you've got to push yourself. How do you know what you can achieve if you first don't go for something that's ridiculous? And I just think that instead of you going, oh, I think too small, start throwing that why word in. Why shouldn't I get better clients? Why shouldn't I try that marketing campaign? Why shouldn't I go for a million bucks a month? Throw that why in there to challenge and demand more of yourself. Because everyone plays small. Everyone's terrified. Everyone's fearful. But for me, I'm not frightened of trying. I'm frightened of not trying. I'm frightened of being here, staying here, standing here, and not expanding. Because when you try something, and you can vouch for this, how many times have you tried something and you've fucked up, you failed, and then you've gone, oh, but I just learned this valuable lesson. Oh, I just got that out. Oh, had I not tried that, that wouldn't have happened. And that's where the beauty is. That's where the gold is. So you've got to try. Yes, react to fear, but use it to work for you rather than against you. Another great rant. Thank you. So many good uh, pearls of wisdom in there. I jot down a bunch of notes. Uh, guys, there's going to be detailed show notes so you can refer back to these different timestamps. Thank you, Steve. This is excellent. And I'm so glad that you brought in as well the art of reflection because when, when we look backwards, we can see the breadcrumb trail so clearly if we take the time to reflect. Now, when you're in it, whether it's failure in business, a relationship, anything that feels like failure, depression, depressive type symptoms, anything at all, what is your advice for anyone that's in it and can't really zoom out and see that it's happening for them and they're kind of caught in that, the victim mentality of, oh, this is happening to me and getting excuse-based? So... I've often wondered, should I write a book on excuses just to help all of those people out? Um, but I think they've got enough of them already. Um, and that'd probably come up with an excuse not to buy the excuse book because that's what excuse people do. Uh, I remember a friend of mine, um, he's lost but never gone, Dr. Sean Stevenson. And he always used to say that anything that ever happened, he would go, hey, did this happen to me or did it happen for me? And if you suddenly start changing the way you look at things by asking yourself that question, it'll reframe how your mind accepts it. And it'll also open up your mind to go, hang on a minute, the shit hit the floor, but was that good or bad? You know, and when, when asked with that question, your head starts going ding, ding, ding. Oh, hang on a minute. This is a great reason for you to replace that carpet great. I've always hated that carpet. Let's get a new car. That's an advance. You see, it's only a failure when you didn't learn from it. I remember, um, do you remember Elon Musk when he would send the rockets up and then the uh, re reusable fuel cells would come off the side and they would land on that floating platform in the middle of the ocean, tip over and then explode. Do you remember seeing that? Yeah, I do. Yeah. Everyone does. The damn thing came off. Now, bear in mind, it's miles above the planet and manages to land on that bloody floating platform. That in itself is a sodden miracle. Yet, you know, the fact that it topples over and explodes, everyone goes, oh, it's a failure. 
It was only a failure on the final bit. It transferred from there to there with pinpoint accuracy. And then it fell over. And when I, when I was at one of the events and I noticed this, when it exploded, everyone in the back of the room went, oh, shit. And they recoiled. Their hands went up to that phone. Oh, my God. Everyone in the room grabbed hold of the desk and leant in. Hang on, where did it go wrong? And they leant into the problem. They leant into the explosion. They leant into the failure. Where's the education on that? It got from here to here. So 99% of it worked, but that last little bit didn't. Now, by them leading into the problem, they were able to correct that last bit. When was the last time you saw it tip over? Actually, rephrase this. When was the last time you saw a video on the news station of that reusable uh, rocket landing on the platform? When was the last time? Oh, I have no idea. No. How many times, just approximately in the last year, do you think he sent a rocket up into space? If I had a guess, because I have no idea, maybe five, but it's probably way more. Way more. Yeah. The reason you don't see it anymore is one simple reason. It works. <laughs> it doesn't topple over and explode anymore. Yeah. So in which case, people are like, oh, shit, it works. Well, I'm bored now. On to the next thing. What else is hurting? <sighs> you see, our news station only wants to show shit that people get hurt. They have a trauma. There's distress. And it's annoying. You watch the news. And I had this conversation with Peter Diamandis a while ago. He said, you wake up in the morning, you're fresh. You get out of bed, you stretch, your dogs are there, your wife's there, the kids are safe, everyone's great. And you walk outside, sun shining, especially if you're in California, you put your coffee on and you put the news on. And then for the next two hours, the news station tells you how fucked the planet is recessions, depressions, riots, wars, arguments, lawsuits, murder, rape, pillage, all the bad shit for two hours. And then at five to nine, in the last few moments of that, that two-hour news release, there's a little picture in there about a dog that got its leg back and can now walk or a child that can see, or a school that got built in a bad area, and now he's raising smart people. And they think, hey, that little five-minute jaunt at the end, that'll repair all the shit you got through. And you'll watch it, and then spend the next few hours getting yourself back into a positive state before you get back on with the day. Peter Diamanda says the most impactful, important thing he did with his world was use one of his digits to make sure the news was never turned on in the morning. If it's important, someone will text him. If it's vital, someone will call him. And maybe in the evening, he'll watch the news just to capture up on what's going on in the planet. But when we look at the news, you cannot be anything other than pissed off and violent. Because it's constant trauma, it's constant pain, it's constant roadkill that we just become addicted to and think that's the normal. And I think it's all down to mindset. It's how you see things and how you enact with them and how you react to them. And that's the key. How do you react to something happening to you? And it's your choice. No one else is in your head. It's down to you. And if you want to dream small and, and think small, then you are small. And if you believe it can't happen, you're right. But just imagine if one day you woke up and you went, I'm not small, and I believe it can. What could be achieved? I love this so much, Steve, because where my mind goes when I hear you talk about the news that way it's um, anger that comes up and it's a, it's also a lot of weakness in terms of like that we can't change this system because I have some very deep seated feelings about the conditioning of society and it, you know I don't go far down the quote unquote conspiracy path, but I've gone down and I don't choose to live there. but we're I, what I love about the way you speak about this is it's empowering. And I think there's a lot of narratives, whatever side you are on the news or any of this type of stuff, you could be on one side or the far end of the other, both sides are in fear, right? But I, I like what you're saying in terms of kind of owning your shit and then chasing what you want or 
living your truth really rather than getting stuck in either end of the spectrum because there's plenty of people that i'm sure you know as well that are very pissed off in terms of seeing that with the news and then live in that state which is almost just as bad as living in the state of always watching the news and always being in fear you know yeah, no, spot on, spot on. We have a lot more of a control over our life today than we actually think we do. The other bad thing is we actually turn around and we say that, you know, society's bad today. In the book, one of the things that caught me, um, and I wasn't writing a book, I was just doing research. You know, I was pissed off with the way people were acting with each other and I was just searching. And I thought to myself at the time, today's society is bad because of the evil media empire. Media is a distribution channel. You can turn it off, okay? But it's it's led by the it's led by those that are there to manipulate, and it's watched by the masses and the idiots. There you go. You hate that statement? Fuck it, don't care. But that's basically what it is. But is it a today problem? And the answer is no. We've had that problem for years. Many things over the years we've rioted against, we've stood up against, we've hated. Because as human beings, as much as we talk about Darwin and how we're always evolving, as human beings, we don't like change. We yeah. like, to, look at the records, look at the audio of today. Someone will pick their favorite star and then you'll notice that the chords are actually the same. It's repetitive music because people like it. And when the artist tries something that, like, different, they go, oh, I don't, I, they should go to back to what they do that's good. You know, how, how often have you bought a car and then at the end of the year, they've done a facelift on it and everyone hates the new, I hate the new car. You know, oh God, the, the new car's bloody disgusting. I prefer, six months later, you fall in love with it. Human beings, we're not good with change. You know, we're mm -hmm. actually not very good with it. You've got to learn as an entrepreneur to opportunize your mindset and be open to that change because that's where the benefit is. OK, and to do that, the first thing you've got to do is you've got to get comfortable with being uncomfortable because shit doesn't go your way. The amount of times like I coach a lot of people and the conversations are things like, oh, the recession, the depression, you know, I don't know the war. You know, I, I don't know what's going on. That's the problem. We don't know what's going on. I don't know if we're in a recession. I don't know if we're in a depression. I do know we're in a distraction. And that's what we've got to do because that distraction is going to happen again in a few years time when we're out of it and the money's going through, we're going to be distracted with money and wealth. And then there's going to be an adjustment and we're going to be distracted by that. And then there's going to be a new government coming in. We're going to be distracted with that. We've got to learn to handle distraction and that's where you benefit. Well said brother. I, I love it. And what would be some, tools and tactics and techniques that you would recommend to people in terms of uh, handling these distractions that are always coming? Do things differently on a day-to-day -day basis, okay? And risk everything. Um, this is a weird thing, but here's a little game that we always do as a family. Started off as a funny little game, but actually taught us something. Whenever we go to a restaurant as a family, we look at the appetizer menu and I would always pick two appetizers. Okay, I got a family of five. I'd pick one of the things that we know and we like, and then I'd pick something that I've never heard of before. Okay. And my family would be like, oh, but I want, I want these two things. Nope. We're going to try something new on every single meal we ever have. And my kids used to moan at me. Now, when we go out, they're like, oh, can I pick the weird thing? Mm -hmm. And they want to pick the weird thing. Now, here's the thing when your mind tells you, Right, okay, we're not going to do what we always do. We're going to do something different. When you're driving home, turn right a couple of stops up. Go down a side street you've never been before. You know, we literally try different streets all the time. Also, when you're at, a, um, when you're at home and you're working, why don't you go onto the radio stations? I use, uh, um, I, uh, not iRadio, I forget what the- I heart. My, uh, no, it's the it's the radio platform where all the radio stations are on. I think it may be called um, iRadio or something. My radio, maybe. But anyway, pick the radio station from a country you've never heard of 
and a, a you know just randomly pick it and get your mind to for one hour listen to that. Now a little while ago, I was listening. It was um, eleven o'clock in the morning, and I was listening to Norwegian EDM. And so it's early in the morning in Norway, and I'm listening to electronic dance music. And I listened to it for an entire hour. I couldn't understand what the host was saying. And I listened to this EDM music for one hour. Had I not listened to that for one hour, I would not be qualified enough to be able to say that it's the biggest load of garbage I've ever heard in my life. (laughs) But it taught my mind to be open to trying new things. I'll, I'll ask you an example. You know when you're in a car park or you're shopping for a new car, Okay, and you see a car and it's a weird color, maybe, I don't know, a a lime green or a mustard yellow. And you see this weird color that you've never come across before. When you're driving home, what's the only color car you can see on the road? It's that color. Yes, exactly. When your mind suddenly starts ordering an appetizer you've never had before, listening to a radio station you've never listened to before, watching a TV show that you've never watched before, going down a street you've never done before, all of a sudden your mind goes, whoa, we're working differently now, fellas. We've now got to open up to opportunity. we got to find stuff that he doesn't normally do and bring attention to it. When you are open to opportunity, Just like that weird color car, what's the only thing you see on a day-to-day basis? Opportunity. That's how you do it. Start off with stuff that's not going to hurt you. I'm not telling you to sell your house and bet it on crypto. I'm telling you to try simple, simple stuff. I love it. What's coming up for me is the unroutine. Bingo. Anti-routine. My son, my son, and I taught him well, and I was very proud. It was a real proud moment. My, uh, my son works with me. We have a company called Sims.media. And um, two weeks ago, he turned around and he said, yeah, you can't get me Monday because I'm going skiing. And he went skiing up in the hills in Big Bear. He could have gone on Saturday. He could have gone on Sunday, but he went on Monday because it's quieter on a Monday and because he can. The bottom line of it is how can you disrupt your life by following the parameters of everything else. You work Monday to Friday. Screw that. How can you possibly disrupt what you want out of life by the conforming to everyone else's parameters? And I was thrilled that he did it. He ended up doing a lot of work on the Sunday and then catching up with what he missed on the Tuesday. So we didn't lose anything, but he was in control of what he wanted to do. And a lot of people who watch me will know that I go motorcycle racing midweek. Again, I'm in control of when I work, how I work, and where I work. I can't tell other people to be in control of their life if I'm not in control of mine and allowing myself to disrupt it when I want it. Okay, last question or topic, at least. Uh, to- family and entrepreneurship, family and business. You know, the world that we're living in now, so many people are working from home, especially business owners. Like, it doesn't make sense these days for most people, depending on the business to go get an uh, office suite or even get a space at WeWork. You know, for many of us, it makes more sense to work from home. In terms of owning your schedule as an entrepreneur or business leader and working from home and balancing a family, is there anything that you've learned over the years, either with yourself, your clients, or that you've seen that comes up for you in terms of uh, continuing to push the needle forward as an entrepreneur, but, but not uh, leaving your family behind? Yeah, and we learn everything by things going wrong. You know, we learn, we learn to be careful with a hammer when we, we smash it on our thumb. So um, everything I've learned, has just been that kind of scenario. So I actually, I looked at my calendar many, many years ago. And I looked at my calendar and I dare anyone out there to do the same. Look at your calendar. And in your calendar, you've got appointments with clients. You've got podcasts. You've got the dentist. You've got your accountant. You've got your attorney. Everything's in there in your schedule, in your calendar. 
Two thirds of it, shit you don't want. I don't want to talk to my attorney and I love my attorney. Sure, shit, don't want to talk to my accountant, you know? And I don't want to go to the dentist. But it's all in there, okay? And because it's in there, I go and do it. So how come all of the stuff I don't want to do, I prioritize over the stuff that I do want to do? So then what I started doing was I started booking my family. And I got a lot of abuse from this. I got abuse from some of the members of my family. And I got abuse from people in my office that would look at my calendar and they'd be like, you know, it's a bit rude that you're booking time with your wife and you're booking time with your kids. And I would literally have Monday, 4.30 p.m., walk the dog with my wife. Tuesday morning, make breakfast for my son. And people are like, why do you need to do that? Because it's important to me. And still now I have uh, appoint appointments with my wife and with my family. And I'll literally go, right, H Henry, George, I'm having breakfast with you in a couple of Wednesdays time. Can you do that? And we'll literally just go out to a different breakfast, an IHOP, a McDonald's, a Denny's, whatever, and just sit there and spend time. So I realized very early on, you got to focus on yourself and what's important to you. We're all in business, but what the, what are we in business for? You know, that's, that's the key. What are you doing it for? Mm -hmm. You do the stuff you don't want to do. So you get to do more of what you do want to do. I love it. Yep. That resonates. And I could keep going with so many more questions and the wheels are spinning. I'm uh, inspired. I hope you guys listening are inspired. Steve, I want to thank you for taking the time to talk about all these different topics, which really are all going to be culminated in your book. Go for stupid disclaimer. I am going to buy it right now. I'm one of those hosts that reads it after and I don't read it before. Definitely an area for me to work on, but I'm inspired to read it. So thank you, Steve. Appreciate you taking the time to come on the podcast, brother. I appreciate being here. Thanks for having me.